Good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm hoping so. <laughs> if not, just let me know. Well, actually, I guess you can't if you can't hear me. All right, <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for letting me know. I'll turn on the, the video. All right, so hopefully you guys can see me as well. Hopefully. <laughs> All right, so welcome to today's lecture. Again, the whole purpose of today's lecture is to show you how to do virtual work in Mathematica. I know that's kind of been the only real trouble I've seen thus far in the course. Uh, students, when they ask me questions, at least thus far, again, have been solely Mathematica questions. It hasn't really been concept-based questions, which is really good, but really bad. <laughs> I'm getting the private messages. Yeah, no. I told you guys to do something fun. I thought I would do something fun too. <laughs> uh, we'll see how it goes. Oh, you guys are hilarious. All right, so yeah, again, today we're just gonna go through and we're basically going to look at the virtual work method in Mathematica. Now, what's nice about this is once we have the code for basically any approximation function, it's very simple to modify the code for a different approximation function, which is gonna be great for us because what we are going to do in this lecture is we are going to start very simple and we're going to increase the complexity and see how the approximation actually approaches the exact solution, which will be great for us. So the example that we are going to do today, I have it posted on eClass, but I'll just bring it into the screen now, is this one right here. So I'm hoping you guys can all see it. We have a, a cantilever beam, so it's gonna be fixed at the left-hand side. It has a distributed load Q, and it has a point load P. So again, by the end of this lecture, we'll have the code for this particular example for virtual work. But the nice thing is, is once you have the code for virtual work for any type of beam, it's very easy to modify it for whatever else. Let me ask you guys in chat right now, how would I switch between a fixed support beam and a simply supported beam? What's the only thing I'm changing in my code? What do you guys think? What's well, gonna be the only thing I changed in my code between two different beam types. Boundary conditions, exactly. Now, another thing I'm going to ask really quick, is everybody comfortable with me putting chat on the recorded screen so that it can answer any questions that uh, online students or anyone else may have? Uh, basically, your name will show up in the video. Is that okay? Okay, sure. If you, don't, if you have a problem with it, just let me know and I can remove it later in the editing. So. I have chat here on screen. You guys have chat as well, so you guys know what's going on. But for the purposes of the people that will watch later on, it'll be good for them to know. But yes, the correct answer is boundary conditions. So what you're going to see is once we have the code for this beam, you basically have the code for the beam in your assignment. The beam in the assignment is not exactly this. It's a little bit different. But again, the only difference that you will have to make for the assignment is going to be just switching those boundary conditions. Now, one thing that the beam has here that the assignment does not is a point load P. We talked about it a little bit last lecture, but how do we account for a point load P in our code or in the virtual work method or exact solution? Where does the point load P kind of act in for uh, the exact solution? How do we account for a point load? Do you guys remember? <laughs> no one? Yeah, we solve it two times, but basically the actual point load itself will be incorporated into the boundary conditions. So again, the whole goal here, once you have the code, you're good to go. All you have to do is change the boundary conditions and then that's going to be it. So again, this lecture should be nice, simple. We're gonna go through it very, very like slow. <laughs> I was gonna say smooth, but that just sounds weird. We're gonna go through it very slow. But uh, yeah, it should, should be nice and easy. Before we begin though, I would like to ask you guys to complete, please complete your USRIs if you haven't already done so. I would appreciate it a lot. Uh, I can check right now. Where, where do you think we're sitting at? For U USRIs, we have 37%. So once we get to 50%, I promise I will give you all a final exam review. If we get to, I was gonna say 85, but that's that's a lot. If you get to 75, I will do two 
final exam reviews. Now, two doesn't sound like a lot, but keep in mind that those final exams are 50 questions. So if we get to 75%, I'm basically solving 100 practice questions for everybody, which is uh, a lot of time. I think it would have to be four unique sessions, something like that. All right. So that was my little spiel about USRIs. Again, if you have the time, please do so. Uh, I'm not looking for you to give me a positive review at all. I, I want to make that clear. If I did a terrible job, please let me know. Again, that's the whole goal of USRIs. Let me know if I'm doing a terrible job so that I can switch it kind of for next semester whenever I teach again. All right, so here we go. I'm just going to put chat to the side for now because the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to take all the parameters and we're going to put them into Mathematica. So we're gonna do this together right now. Uh, I guess before we begin, does anyone have any questions? Any questions? I'm hoping everyone's nice and happy. All right, I'm going to assume so. If you have any questions, throw it in chat. We'll be good to go. All right, so the first thing that I always do in Mathematica is I always want to put something that will clear my variables before every run. It sounds pretty trivial, but that was the number one thing I found when using the desolve function students had problems with. They would use the desolve function, they would get their answer, but then when they ran the code a second time, it would lead to an error. And the reason why is the desolve function itself is trying to solve for an unknown. In our case, the unknown would be the displacement. So we'd use the desolve function to solve for the unknown displacement. The problem is, is once you run the code twice, the displacement's not unknown anymore. It's actually known and stored in Mathematica. So that's what led to an error a lot of the time. So in order to clear variables, I use the clear function. So it's just gonna be clear. And then inside, I put two of these. I go global. I use this little character. I wanna say tilde, but it's not tilde. It's the same character that's on the tilde key, just to the left of one, and I go star. So this right here will clear my variables after every run. It's the equivalent of in MATLAB going clear CLC, kind of the same thing. So that's the first thing I do. Second thing I do is I always want to define the parameters that I'm going to use in my code. So I'm just gonna go parameters, something like this. And as we can see, we have a whole list of parameters over here. So I'm just going to go down the list and I'm going to basically write it all down. So we have our height of the beam. So this is related to the cross section as basically 400 millimeters or 0.4 meters. So personally, it's up to you guys, whatever you want to solve it in. But for units, I always like to go newtons, millimeters and MPA. And the reason why is because if I solve for two, for the third answer, it'll always be the same. So newton, Newtons, millimeters, and MPA. So as we can see here, we have 400 millimeters. So I'm going to go 400, nice and simple. The second one is B, which is kind of the width of the beam in the X3 direction. So I'm gonna go B. And as we can see, that's equal to 200 millimeters, 200. And then after that, we start to get into the loads. So we have Q. And we know it's 10 kilonewtons per meter. But I already told you guys, I don't want to screw around with kilonewtons. That's, that's not fun. I want everything in newtons and millimeters. So question for you guys in the chat. If I want Q in terms of newtons per millimeter, not kilonewtons per meter, but newtons per millimeter, what's it going to be? What do you guys think? If it's 10 kilonewtons per meter, what's it going to be? 10? Are you sure? David, are you telling me that I don't need to make any modification at all? Seems too obvious. Anyone going to agree or disagree with David? No? Everyone's too scared? David's my only brave person? Agree? Perfect. It's true. It is actually just going to be 10. Because for kilonewtons to newtons, we times by a thousand, but then for the millimeters, we have to divide by a thousand. So it cancels out in the end. So I'm going to put in 10. Now, again, question for everybody in the chat here. Is my input correct? 10. Is everybody happy with 10? 
Ah, negative 10, yes. Remember that when we derived all these expressions, we had our distributed load Q pointing upwards. So if we want to model a load going downwards, we actually have to make it negative. So that's gonna be the first thing. Another thing I notice a lot when students do these problems and they get an error, it's usually having to do with the load going the wrong way. So Q is negative 10. The next one is our point load P, which is 50 kilonewtons. So we know that that's going to be 50,000 newtons. Is that good to go? What do you guys think? Should this also be negative? Should P also be negative as well? It's pointing downwards, as we can see on our diagram over here. Yeah, no one's sure. For the point load, it doesn't really matter. Uh, to keep consistency, we will put it as negative, but once we actually incorporate it, as everyone will see, it doesn't make a big difference as long as you incorporate it correctly, if that makes sense. I find that actually making it negative will confuse students more often than not. So we'll see how that goes in the end. So that's our two loads. Uh, next, we have some dimensions of the beam. So the length of the beam is four meters or 4,000 millimeters. And we have a distance D to the point load, which is three meters or 3,000 millimeters. And then the last one is our Young's modulus. So again, another common error. I don't see this one as much, but something to be aware of is that if we have a black symbol like we do right now, it means that it's already defined in Mathematica. So we can't actually use it. We have to substitute something else. So I'm gonna go E, M. As we can see, E, M here is now blue, meaning undefined. And we know that it's going to be 20,000 or 200,000 MPa. Perfect, so that's, that's my variables. Is everybody happy with variables? Any questions? Or is this making sense so far? I'm hoping that uh, everybody's happy not having too much of a problem thus far. All right, so again, if you have questions, throw it in chat. If not, we will continue on. So we have all the parameters defined for our beam. So, so far we're good to go. Before we get into the actual virtual work though, I want to discuss how would we find the exact solution to this beam? You guys have all played with the differential equation thus far, and it was a lot of fun. You guys were having a great time, I can tell. But again, one thing we discussed in class is we've never dealt with the situation where we've actually had a point load. We've dealt with a beam with a distributed load, but never a point load in between. And one of the things that we talked about last lecture is if this is the case, we actually have to split the beam into two parts. So we're gonna have a part kind of on the left-hand side of the point load, and we're going to have a part on the right-hand side of the point load. So basically, we have to solve two differential equations, one governing the deflection on the left, and then one governing the deflection on the right. So I'm gonna come down here, and we are going to find the exact solution. So that's gonna be the first part. Again, the question doesn't really want it, but it'll be really nice to compare how our approximations come to that exact solution. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say, well, actually, should I minimize this? Yeah, I, I guess we don't really need this. You guys all know what the beam looks like. So I'm going to minimize that, maximize that, put chat up in the corner. And here we go. So the first thing that we just said is that we actually have two differential equations we want to solve for. So I'm going to say differential equation one, and they're both governed by the same differential. So I'm going to have EM times IG, so the flexural stiffness, multiplied by the deflection function, fourth derivative, so one, two, three, four, which will be a function of X1 minus Q. So I did that pretty fast, but it, remember this comes directly from topic seven when we talked about Euler-Bernoulli beams. We take EI and multiply it by the fourth derivative of our deflection function, and that's gonna be equal to the distributed load Q. So I just brought Q over to the other side. So we know that in this form, this is gonna be equal to zero. But again, the, the first thing that I mentioned that we're gonna to have to count for is we actually have two different deflection functions, one for the left-hand side and one for the right-hand side. So what I'm going to do in this code is I'm going to keep it the same, 
but I'm just going to make my deflection function unique. So I'm going to have y1. This will be my deflection function for the left-hand side. I'm going to take this exact code right here, because it's the same differential equation. I'm going to copy it. And for here, I'm going to have y2. And of course, this will be my second differential equation. So again, both half of, halves of the beam here, they're governed by the same differential equation, but they're going to have different deflection functions, which is why I put y1 and y2 rather than just keeping it simply as y. So I'm gonna suppress these. And as you guys may know really quick, we're going to have a problem. Because if we look at here, we have ig, our moment of inertia. And if we look at our parameters, we actually didn't define any sort of moment of inertia. So that's gonna be one thing that we're gonna to have to do. But we know that for a rectangular cross section, it's just gonna be base times height cubed divided by 12. That was the best part about assignment eight. A lot of students messaged me, Clayton, I have this base term, I have this height term in my answer, but the, the assignment's being a dick, it's not accepting it. But then when you look at their answer, every single person got it right. It was base times height cubed. So I didn't actually even tell them moments of inertia, I just said base times height cubed, and then every student was like, oh, yeah, that looks familiar, never mind. <laughs> so we're gonna have base times height cubed divided by 12. Now, I, I don't know why it's just me, but I always like to put exponents in brackets. It doesn't actually matter. It's just something that uh, I prefer. So if we look at this equation, we have the elastic modulus, which we have defined. We have our moments of inertia, which we've defined. We have our deflection function, which we want to solve for. And we have Q, which we actually have defined as well. So, so far, we're good to go. We only have one unknown in each equation, which is our deflection function. Uh, question in tests, will you explicitly tell us if it's a rectangular cross section or just can you assume it? I will tell you. On all the tests, I will tell you exactly if it's going to be rectangular, triangular, something like that. But one thing to note is most likely it'll be rectangular. Otherwise, it just becomes a moment of inertia question, which is rather difficult. Uh, not difficult, time consuming, I'd say is the best question. So chances are, if I were to give you a moment of inertia that was not rectangular, I would just give you the function of the moment of inertia or something like that to make your lives a little bit easier. So hopefully that answers your question. All right. So now that we have our differential equation, we can go into our d-cell function and solve for them. Now, the nice thing about this is even though we're solving for two functions, we can do it in the same desolve equation. So just like before, I'm going to say my solution is equal to desolve. And inside we are going to input the same kind of three characteristics we had before. So remember, if we want three inputs, they're going to be separated by commas. The first one is going to be what is our equations and what are they equal to? The second one is what are the unknowns? And then the last thing is what is the variable in the differential equation? What is the variable? So we know that the variable in our differential equation is x1. It's the only variable that we actually have. So right here, I can put x1. That shouldn't be a problem. The second part is, what is the equations we're trying to solve for? Well, if we look here, we want to solve for y1 and we want to solve for y2. So right here, instead of just putting one input like we typically do, I'm gonna put in the squiggle brackets. Again, squiggle brackets are used if we have more than one. And I'm going to put our two equations. So I want y1, which is a function of x1. And I also want y2, which is a function of x1 as well. So there's gonna be kind of the first change that we see. We're not just solving for one, we're actually solving for two of them. And then the first one again is what is our equations and what are they equal to? So I'm gonna put in squiggle brackets because we're gonna have quite a bit. And the first thing that we know right off the bat is both of our differential equations here, DE1 as well as DE2, they're gonna be equal to zero. So I can say differential equation one, well, that's gonna be equal to zero. Differential equation two, that's gonna be equal to zero. So question for everyone here in the chat, if I were to run this code right now, am I going to get an error? What do you think? Am I going to get an error 
if I run this code. Who thinks I'm going to get an error? No one? You think I'm an expert coder? No problem at all? Let's find out. Let's run it. Remember. Ah, Dallas is on his game. If I were to run it by going shift enter, I don't get an error and it solves my differential equations. But as we can see, we have a bunch of unknown coefficients, which Dallas said. So nice job, Dallas. If we look here, we have C1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So this is kind of the nice thing about differential equations is we can solve them. We can find their coefficients because the number of coefficients that we have is the number of boundary conditions that we need. So if I have eight coefficients, I'm going to need eight boundary conditions. This is nothing new to you because in assignment seven, you had your four boundary conditions and you were able to solve it. So we're gonna go back up here. And in this first input here in our desolve function, this is where we start throwing in all of our boundary conditions. So I'm gonna pull up the beam in Word and I want you guys to tell me really quick, give me a boundary condition. What boundary conditions would we have for this beam? Remember, this half over here on the left is Y1, and this half over here is Y2. So let's see how many boundary conditions you can name for us. Let's see. Deflection at Y1 is zero. Absolutely, we have a fixed end over here on the left. So the deflection is gonna be equal to zero. So in my desolve function, I can add another argument saying that y1 at zero is equal to zero. So again, one thing I want to emphasize, since we're dealing with y1 on the left, it has to be y1, you can't just go y. So there's a good one. Any other one? Let's see if you can name four of them. Let's see. I have complete faith in every one of you. How far can we go? You know, the deflection at the left is zero. Thank you, Sarah. Rotation at Y1 is equal to zero. Again, we have a fixed end over here, so it's not going to rotate. And we know that rotation is the derivative of deflection. So I can say that Y1 prime at zero is equal to zero. Yes, thank you, Gabriel. We know that since we have a free end over on the left-hand side, we know that there can't be any moment at the end of the beam. So again, now that we are dealing with, sorry, the right-hand side, we have to do y2. This part over here is a function of y2. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna say em times ig times y2 double prime at e l, at the end of the beam here, l. Well, that's gonna be equal to zero. So remember, for moments, it's EI times the second derivative. The location is at point L at the end of the beam, and we know it's going to be equal to zero. So now we have three. We're five short. Five. We need five more. One more. Let's see if you can do one more. We have deflection here, rotation here accounted for. We have the moment here. The moment at P is the same at both sides. That's true. So I was trying to get the last one out over here. So uh, Gabriel's already ahead of the game. <laughs> but let's just ask you a quick question here. Will there be shear at the end of the beam? Will there be shear at the end of the beam? No, you're right. There will be no shear at the end of the beam. It's a free end. So one of the other things I can do is I can say that there's going to be no shear at the end of the beam. So I'm just going to expand this. We're going to say, okay, we know that the moment at the end is zero, but now we also know, I guess I'll move Chad over to the other side. <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of playing around with Chad. We know that the shear, which is EI times the third derivative, one, two, three, at point L, well, that's gonna be equal to zero. So I'm gonna pull up word again for two seconds, if I can find it. We now accounted for two boundary conditions on the left. We have two boundary conditions on the right. Our last four boundary conditions are going to come at this point right here. Gabriel already kind of mentioned it, but is the moment going to be the same at this point? Yes, the moment is going to be the same. 
if we were to draw a bending moment diagram, there's not going to be a sudden jump in it. It's going to be continuous at this point. Will the deflection also be the same at this point? What do you think, chat? Will the deflection at this point going to be the same? Yes, exactly. How about the rotation? How about the rotation? Will there be a jump in rotation? The rotation will actually just be the exact same as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to incorporate everything that is the exact same. So I'm going to move chat to the side because this is getting <laughs> pretty long. But we know that the deflection y1 at location d is equal to the deflection y2 at the same location. So again, I just say that the deflection at point D, well, that's equal to the deflection at point D of Y2. I can do the exact same thing for rotation. So I can say Y1 prime at D is equal to Y2 prime at D. And then our last one, of course, is going to be uh, moment, or the last one that we talked about. So EM times IG times y1 double prime at d is equal to em times ig. This is why it's better to store it as ei <laughs> rather than em times ig. y2, oops, something like this. So again, we have our deflections the same, our rotations the same, our moment is the same. So our last one, of course, is going to be shear. Now let's see chat again. Is shear going to be the same? Is my shear going to be the same at both sides of those points? <laughs> yes or no? Is my shear going to be the same? No, it's not. If we were to look at a bending moment diagram, as you remember, when we have a point load going downwards, it drops it, right? It drops it. I'm hoping you remember that from Edge 130. So we know that our shear is going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to go back to this equation. I'm going to add in shear. Oh, hold on. Since moment is the same and E, M times IG are the same, could I just say Y1 double prime is equal to Y2 double prime? Yes, I definitely could. But it's one of those ones that if you get in the habit of that, and for some reason it's not the same, well, you're going to start running into problems. So for particular scenarios, yes, you can. But for other scenarios, no, you can't. So I just like to keep it in for correctness, I guess. I'm not even sure if that's a word, but just correctness. But yeah, that's, that's a good point to make. So EM times IG times Y1, 1, 2, 3 at D. So this would be the shear on the left is equal to EM times IG times Y2, 1, 2, 3 at D. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take into account that our shear now drops by P. And this is why I said that the sign of P doesn't really matter too much because this is the only real spot in our code where we're actually going to account for P. So all we have to do is we have to make sure that we account for basically a drop in P. So how, how do you think we do that? If I wanted to go plus P, all right, if I wanted to add a plus P, would I add it to the left-hand side or would I add it to the right-hand side? If I wanted to just add plus P to my code, what do you think? Left-hand side or the right-hand side? It's getting tricky. This is the number one confusing thing when it comes to these point loads. Would I go plus P over here or plus P over here? All right, so Jonathan says the right-hand side. So plus P. Who agrees with Jonathan? Oh, left-hand side. Got some discrepancy. So delete that, plus P over here. This is where it gets a lot of fun. The correct answer is the left-hand side because we defined it as negative. So this is where I said, for, when it comes to P, it doesn't really matter if you define it as positive or negative, as long as you ensure that for this part right here, 
you're accounting for a drop. If we have it here, we are basically saying that the shear on the right-hand side is equal to the shear on the left-hand side plus a drop, because since it's negative, we're actually dropping it. If we were to define P as positive, then we can move it to the other side. But we didn't define it as positive. We defined it as negative. So that's it. If I were to run this code right now, am I going to get my exact solution? What do you think? Exact solution or nah, not yet. Domain? What's lucky for us is the only time we have to define domains is when we start getting into realms that are physically impossible. For Euler Bernoulli beams, the only way that that could happen is if the actual uh, moment of inertia were to somehow become negative. Since we have a constant moment of inertia as well as a constant elastic modulus, we actually don't have to worry about domain. The only reason why we had to in that one particular problem was because when we had that area function, it was coming down. So at some point the area would actually cross and become negative. If I were to run this code right now, do we have our exact solution? What do you think? Are there any unknowns in this equation or are we good to go? I guess I can move chat back up on screen because we're not dealing with the long thing. Is this good to go? We good, yes, we good. So it's one of those fun things that if you're not sure, just run the code. <laughs> the code will tell you if you got it right or wrong. So this is going to be this. So notice how it says right now that my solution is Y1 approaches something, Y2 approaches something. So one thing that we had in the Discord was, okay, I have this solution. How do I save it as variables? What you do is you would say something like Y1 is equal to Y1 as a function. Oops as a function of x1, because that's how we have it defined right here, y1 as a function of x1, when solution of one. Now what's nice is if we look at our solution, we don't just have y1, we have y1 and y2. So what I can do is I can modify this for squiggle brackets, oops, y1 comma y2 is equal to, in squiggle, squiggle brackets, y1 as a function of x1, y2, as a function of x1 when solution of one. If I were to run this, I now have y1 and y2 stored. So if I were to suppress this and just simply go y1 oops, and y2, I now have them stored as variables besides themselves, which is great. Another trick that we can do is I can do the exact same thing to find moments. I can say moment one and moment two well, that's going to be equal to the derivative, or I guess EI times the derivative. So I'm just going to take this out. EM times IG times the derivative. And inside of my derivative function, I can just input them both directly. Y1, Y2. I'm taking it with respect to X1, and I'm doing it twice. So it's just like what we had before, but rather than saying M1 is equal to the derivative of Y1, I can do m1 and m2 and the derivative of y1, y2. And I get both of my moment functions. Isn't that nice? If I want shear, I can just copy and paste it because it's basically the exact same code. Instead of m1 and m2, I can have v1 and v2. And we know that this is going to be the same, but now it's the third derivative. So if I were to do that, I now have my shear functions. So what we're going to do is we are going to plot it really quick. Plot solutions. How do we do that? Well, we use our plot function, which everyone is very familiar with. So we're going to go plot. And for the plot function, we basically take in, well, there's a couple different arguments, but basically we're going to take in our function and then we are going to talk about the domain. So this first part over on the left, this will be our function. And then the second part over here, this would be our actual domain. So we know our domain for this particular case is x1. We're going over the x1 direction and we're going from zero to L. So that's not too bad at all. Another thing I like to put in is our aspect ratio. 
and I set it around uh, 0.25. This basically just takes a square plot and makes it more rectangular. It just makes it look more like a beam. Basically, that's all I'm going for. We can add some labels to it. So I'm gonna go axis label. And for axis label, it's basically just squiggle brackets and inside you put your two things. So we're gonna plot the deflection. Or I guess the, this would be the X axis. This would be the beam length. And it have units of millimeters. Our second one would be deflection. Units of millimeters as well. And here's going to be one of the problems you run into, not in this assignment, but next assignment, is how do we plot this function? If we look at our function, we have two of them. We have y1 and y2. We know that for y1, actually, where's the Word document? Where did it go? Here we go. For y1, we only want y1 on this side over here. If we were able to just plot y1, it would have a function that extends kind of all the way throughout. But I want to tell Mathematica, no, I just want y1 for this side. And when it comes to this side, I just want y2. Does anyone remember in math what that's called? Where we have a function that changes at a specific point. Anyone remember? I'm asking you because it'll basically become yeah, piecewise function, exactly. So you guys are already experts. So if I want to plot it right here, I use piecewise right here, and it's a function, so it's going to have square brackets. Now inside of here, what we basically do is we put squiggle brackets, and inside of the squiggle brackets, that's where we input all of our stuff. So I'm gonna have a squiggle bracket for y1, and I'm gonna have a squiggle bracket for y2. I'm gonna separate them with the comma, so we know the first thing is we want y1, and this is basically when x1 is less than or equal to d. The second one is I want y2, and this will be when x1 is greater than d. Right, makes sense. So if I'm kind of to the left-hand side of d, it's gonna go y1. If I'm to the right-hand side, it's going to go to y2. Doesn't matter if I were to go equal sign here, and on this side, I were to take away the equal sign, something like this. What do you think? Will that make a difference? Does it matter which side is the equal to side? What do you think? No. And the reason why is this. The deflection at that point should be the same. In our boundary conditions up here, we said that the deflection at D is the same for both of these functions. So if I were to put that in and I were to plot it, we have our deflection coming downwards. This is why I like to plot it. A lot of your questions don't ask for you to plot it, but it's a good tool to see if you did anything wrong. Because let's say that we didn't have Q as negative. We put it as positive. I'm happy I'm running my code. As we can see, the numbers start to change. It does make a difference. The reason why I didn't flip up is because we had P. If I were to take P away, as we can see, the beam bends upwards. That's how you know you did something wrong. <laughs> the beam's flying up like that. So if we were to go back to negative, the beam comes back to going downwards. P, we said was negative 50,000. Perfect, so we have our deflection function. So that's the exact solution, the exact solution. What happens if I want to add a couple more plots? So I'm going to take this. And instead of just plotting deflection, let's plot moment. And so this, I guess, would be moment. Well, I guess we should divide by a million or else it's going to be really gross. M2. So the, the moment here will have kilonewton meters. If you were to put it as newton millimeters, it's just gonna be huge values. No one has time for huge values. Why, or sorry, we're gonna plot the shear as well. So this is what's nice about code is once you have code, it's so easy to modify. Shear units of kilonewtons. So this would be V1 divided by a thousand. Same with V2 because we have everything in newtons. So if I were to run it, we have everything that we need. 
So as we can see, a lot of the moment comes directly from that point load. That's why we have such a big change. And again, for the shear, if we were to look at our shear diagram, we have that drop due to P, which makes sense. Now, here's the fun thing. In actuality, our exact solution right here, we have that drop, okay? As we can see, we have that drop in shear. In our approximate solution that we're about to do, do you think we'll have a drop in shear? What do you think? Will we have a drop in shear in our exact solution? No, we won't. So that's what you're going to see. This is one of the beautiful things about comparing the exact solution is you will find that if, if you use enough terms, the deflection function is going to be almost identical, which is great. But the moment function is going to look a little bit off, a little bit. But then the shear function is going to look way off. So that's what's the funny thing is your approximate solution is very good for approximating kind of the main function. But every derivative you take, that's when you start seeing, hey, this is an approximation that's starting to look a little bit silly. All right, so we have our exact solution. Let's say that we don't know the exact solution and we want to approximate it. So we're going to go approximate solution. And for this one, we are going to use virtual work. Have to make that clear. I've noticed a lot of students are already starting the Rayleigh Ritz assignment, so there's going to be different methods, but we're going to go virtual work. Now, the first thing of virtual work is we have to assume approximate solution. We as engineers have to provide the assumed approximate solution. Okay, that's the first thing. So the question becomes is, well, how many terms do we want? Typically, we do a polynomial, so we need to pick the number of terms. How many terms do you want? Two, three, four? What are you feeling? I'll ask you guys. We'll do it however many you want. Four terms. All right, let's do four terms. So I'm going to define an approximation function, y approx, as simply a0, first term, plus a1 times x1, second term, plus a2 times x1 squared, third term, plus a3 times x1 cubed. So there's my four terms. Again, this is up to us as engineers. I don't know why there's a space there. A0, A1, A2, and A3. This is what we're going to try and solve for. Remember, X1, that's just the variable. That doesn't need to actually be solved for. So this is our approximate solution. We want to solve for those four coefficients. So I'm gonna ask you guys right now, in the virtual work method, what's the first step that we do? Who remembers? We have our approximation function defined. What would be the first step? Boundary conditions, exactly. Boundary conditions, but more important, or more specifically, essential boundary conditions. For Euler-Bernoulli beams, what would be my essential boundary conditions? Displacement, rotation, moment, shear. What am I looking for for Euler-Bernoulli beams? Who remembers? Displacement and rotation, exactly. So if I were to look at my thing right here, I'll move chat out of the way. How many essential boundary conditions do I have in my beam? How many essential boundary conditions do I have in my beam? What do you think? Essential boundary conditions in this particular beam. Gabriel already told us that it's displacement and rotation. How many spots in this beam do we know the displacement and the rotation? Two, exactly. We know that the displacement at this end over here is equal to zero. And we know that the rotation at this end over here is equal to zero. So we have two essential boundary conditions. Now, another question for chat, question for chat. This approximation function that we've just defined, is this for the left-hand side of the beam or the right-hand side of the beam? What do you think? Is this approximation function for the left-hand side 
or the right hand side. Mm, tricky question. Seem to have stumped you a little bit. Both. Exactly. That's the beautiful thing of approximation methods. We don't need to start chopping up our bean. This right here will apply to the whole bean. Isn't that wonderful? As we look here, there starts to become kind of a change in curvature down here, but our approximation doesn't care about that. It'll say no problem at all. So our essential boundary conditions, we know that the displacement at x1 is zero is equal to zero, and we know the rotation there is zero. So I'm gonna say boundary condition one is equal to my approximate solution, so y approx at the location x1 is equal to zero. So again, this is another Mathematica trick. If I want to specify one of the variables here, all I have to do is use this right here. This is basically saying when x1 is equal to zero. So this is gonna be my first boundary condition equation. My second boundary condition equation, which I'll call boundary condition two, we know that the derivative of our approximation function with respect to x1 specifically when x1 is equal to zero. So I'm actually gonna unsuppress them and we're gonna plot them really quick. We have these two variables. Now what's nice for us is we know that at these two locations, basically our displacement here and our rotation here, they have to be equal to zero. So what I could do, you guys could just theoretically go a naught is equal to zero, a one is equal to zero. But if you want to leave it in terms of code, which I recommend, we can use the solve function and we can say, okay, I have two boundary conditions, boundary condition one, which is equal to zero. We have boundary condition two, which is equal to zero. So we have two equations. We can solve for two unknowns. We can solve for a naught as well as a one. I recommend doing it this way because not all the time will you just have an equation where it's just a naught and a one. Sometimes the solution of a boundary condition will just kind of give a hint towards another. It won't actually have one of the coefficients equal to zero. I think you'll see that in your assignment actually. So from here, this will solve them. Actually, I'll unsuppress it to show you guys what we get. A naught has to be zero. A one also has to be zero. So I'm just going to store those variables. We know a naught and a one is equal to a naught and a one when solution one or one. So now we know that a naught and a one are equal to zero. So if I were to just have my, oops, I did the wrong capital. So if I were to call my approximation function right now, after I do that, as we can see a naught and a one, they're both gone. The last coefficients that we need are a two as well as a three. So after the essential boundary conditions, what do we do? Let's see who remembers. What's the next step? We have an approximation function that satisfies these essential boundary conditions. What would be the next step we do in the virtual work method? Any takers? Virtual coefficients, yes. We now have an approximate displacement function. Therefore, we can find our virtual displacement function. So I'm gonna say virtual displacement function, and I'm going to call it y star. This is our virtual one. And as we said, the only thing that we do to create our virtual displacement function is just take the coefficients of the actual one and replace them with virtual coefficients. So again, this is our actual displacement function, a2 x1 star plus a3 x1 cubed, not star, squared. All I'm going to do is take this equation and replace a2 and a3 with virtual coefficients. So I'm gonna say that my virtual displacement function, while this is gonna be equal to my approximate displacement function when and basically I'm going to use what I did above here where I was able to specify variables in order to switch them. I'm gonna say that a2 is now a2 star, 
and I'm gonna go comma, because I'm gonna add in more than one. I'm gonna say A3 is now A3 star. So if I were to run this code right here, we now for our Y star function, we have the exact same displacement function as before, but instead of A2 and A3, we now have A2 star, A3 star. So that's nice. All you have to do, if you were to have A4, A5, all you have to do is just add on to this string. It's pretty simple. So now we have our approximate displacement, uh, approximate displacement uh, solution, no, function. I, I don't know why I couldn't say function. We have our virtual displacement function. And if I were to go here real quick, and I, if I were to look at the equation for internal virtual work right here, do I have any unknowns? What does it mean when it turns red? It's, it means there's a syntax error somewhere like that. I got a question, it's private. Well, I guess you guys, I'm not sure if you can see the chat. If this turns red, it means that there's a syntax error somewhere in the code. You can send it to me later and I can take a peek. But question for chat, do we know everything in our internal virtual work equation? What do you think? Do we know everything in this super sexy equation? Yes. We have elastic modulus, which we know. Moment of inertia, we know that. We have our approximate displacement function, we know that. And we have our virtual displacement function, we know that. And then the thing to top it off is we integrate it over the length of the beam. We know that as well. So at this point right here, we can start solving for the internal virtual work. So once we have that, I'm gonna come down here in kernel virtual work. And I'm just gonna call it IVW. We know that it's the integral. So I'm gonna use the, oops, integrate, integrate function. And the integrate function is again, basically two things. It's gonna be, what is the function we want to integrate? And what are we integrating it over? So we know that we are going from X1, or the X1 direction from zero all the way to L, that was given right from the equation. And we know that the actual function is going to be the elastic modulus times the moment of inertia times the second derivative of our approximation function. So I'm going to use the derivative. Actually, where did chat go? <laughs> I seem to have lost chat. Uh, where did chat go? Meeting controls. Where is it? Oops. I just about ended the meeting. That would have been fun. Chat. Ah, there you guys are. <laughs> Don't want to add any questions, so it doesn't really matter. Put you guys back up there where I can see you. So we're taking the second derivative of our approximation function. So y approx. Second derivative. So we're going to say x1. That's what we're taking it with respect to. And we're doing it twice. And then this right here is multiplied by the second derivative of our virtual approximation function. So y star, we're differentiating with respect to x1, and we're also doing it twice. So as we can see, we have the whole function again, e times ig times the second derivative of our approximation function times the second derivative of our virtual displacement function. If I were to run it, we get this nasty thing right here. This is why we want to do things in a computer. Could you imagine if I was in the lecture right now, writing all, all those zeros? Oh, you guys would hate me, hate me. <laughs> so that's why we do this. As we can see, it's a function of both our real coefficients as well as our virtual coefficients. So that's our internal virtual work. Next, what we can do is we can say, okay, well, if I did the internal virtual work, we can focus on the external virtual work. Go like this. And I'm gonna come here, I'm back to the Word document. I'll put chat over on the side. If we look at the external virtual work, we basically have two things. We have the integral of the distributed load, Q, multiplied by a virtual displacement function, Y star. Question for you guys really quick in chat. Do we know both of these, Q and Y star? 
What do you think? Do we know everything inside of this integral? Do we know q and y star? Yes, we know everything. Thank you. And then we have to add the point load plus the virtual displacement at that point load. So that's going to be the key thing here. This term right here, everyone can plug and chug. That's not going to be a problem for students. P, again, not a problem for students. Where it becomes a problem for students is this specific part. We take our displacement function, but we have to substitute the value x1 at d. Basically, when we have point loads or concentrated moments, our virtual displacement or rotation for those has to be at the point that it acts. So it's not just going to be y star, it's going to be y star when x1 is equal to d. So what I do for virtual work, you don't have to do this, is I just calculate each one separately. So external virtual work 1, so this will be from uh, our distributed load. We know that this is the integral, so the integrate function, if I could spell, of course, integrate. We know that our function is going to be q times our virtual displacement function, y star. So again, it's just plug and chug, it's nothing bad. And we know we integrate from x1, 0, all the way to l. So we have the external virtual work due to the distributed load. We can also find the external virtual work, which I'll call EVW2, from the point load. Now remember, the point load is going to be P times our virtual displacement function Y star, but it has to be at the location where the point load acts. So this has to be when, and in squiggle brackets, X1 is equal to D. There's the key, X1 is equal to D. If you were to just have this right here, run the code, you're going to run into a lot of problems. And the reason why is this. I'm going to move this over to the side. I'm going to unsuppress our internal virtual work. I'm going to unsuppress our external virtual work one. I'm going to unsuppress our external virtual work two. So I should get three outputs, one, two, three. If we were to look right here, I'll put you guys up in the corner. For our internal virtual work right here, is it a function of x1? Do we have x1 in our internal virtual work? Who can see an x1? E double, oh, okay, thank you for pointing that out. This should be external virtual work. I just had it backwards. Thank you. <laughs> Question remains to be seen though. Is this a function of x1? The answer is no. <laughs> you can't see an X1 in the internal virtual work. If we were to look at the external virtual work due to our distributed load, again, it's not a function of X1. And if I were to not specify the location of point P, we would see that we have X1 in our second external virtual work term. So this is why it becomes a problem. It's an error that if you were to find your virtual work at the end and it's still a function of x1, then you did something wrong. And chances are it's this. So point load p times our virtual displacement function, specifically at the location of where p acts. And we know that p acts at x1 is equal to d. So if I were to run this now, as we can see, our internal virtual work, not a function of x1. Same with our external virtual work, 1, as well as 2. So I'm going to take this and I'm just going to make it kind of a, a total external virtual work. So EVW, EVW1 plus EVW2. This is the other kind of beautiful thing about approximation methods. If I were to suddenly add, oops, I guess I don't have the picture. Let's pull up the picture. If I were to suddenly add another load, let's say right here, all I would have to do in my virtual work expressions is just add an EV, EVW3 term. I can add as many loads as I want. I actually don't really have to do too much work in the code itself. So at this point here, I think we have our internal virtual work. We have our external virtual work. The last thing that we can do, I'm just gonna run it to get rid of the coefficients, is we can actually solve for those coefficients. 
Do you have to factor in the direction of P? Yes. So that's a good point. For the exact solution, it doesn't really matter the sign of P. But when it comes to virtual work, it does. So if P acts downwards, you have to put negative. A great question. Thank you for pointing that out, David. The, the sign would matter for uh, external virtual work. So now that we have our internal virtual work and our external virtual work, and we know that they're equal together or to each other, we can actually solve for the coefficients. And this is why I really wanted to do an example by hand because seemingly we have one equation. So a lot of students say, well, how can I solve for two coefficients with one equation? But as we said, and we did in the example, the coefficient in front of our virtual work, or sorry, our virtual coefficient has to be equal to the same thing on the other side. So if we were to look at our function here, what I can actually, I'll go down here, solve the coefficients. What we can do is we can take the coefficient in front of a2 star for internal virtual work, and we can make it equal to the coefficient of a2 star for the external virtual work. So it's the same thing that we did in the lecture. Now Mathematica is really nice in that it has a function to give us that coefficient. So what we're going to do is we are going to create equations. I'm going to say equation one, and this will focus on the coefficient in front of a2 star is equal to coefficient. As we can see, there's a specific function in Mathematica, coefficient. And what you do is you input two things. First is, what is the function you want to find the coefficient of? Well, that for now, we'll go internal virtual work. And basically, what do you want to find the coefficient of? Well, we want the coefficient of a2 star. So if I were to run this really quick, in our internal virtual work equation, this would be that something, something, something that I would say in lecture in front of a2 star. Now we know that this coefficient must be equal to the same coefficient for the external virtual work. So I'm going to say minus coefficient of the external virtual work a2 star. So if we know internal virtual work has to be equal to external virtual work, but I take external virtual work and move it to the other side, what must this equation be equal to? If I were to take my total internal virtual work and subtract my external virtual work, what should this equation be equal to? Exactly, this should be equal to zero. Now, how many coefficients do I have? Do I just have a2 star or do I have more? What do you guys think? Do we have, do we have more than just a2 star? I'm using this as a water break, basically. You guys can take your time. My voice is very dry. <laughs> All right, you guys are taking too much time. Of course, we know that we also have an A3 star. But what's nice, again, with coding is I would just copy this. I'm going to paste it below. And instead of A2 star, oops, we have A3 star. And this will be equation two. Now, if we look here, we have two equations with two unknowns. We can actually solve for those coefficients. So actually, I'll suppress them so that they don't keep popping up. I'm going to say solution two is equal to solve using the solve function. Again, what are my equations? What are my unknowns? So one squiggle bracket for equations, one squiggle bracket for unknowns. We know that equation one that we defined above has to be equal to zero. And we know equation two defined above equal to zero. We know that what we want to solve for is a2 as well as a3. So if I were to run this, we get what a2 and a3 are equal to. Isn't that so sweet? It's absolutely beautiful. I'm going to store them. So I'm gonna say a2 and a3. Uh, well, I'm gonna store them as themselves is equal to a2 and a3. I know that I had a2 when solution two at one. So now that a, a2 and a3 are stored, if I were to just call my approximation function, we have it. That's our approximation function. There is no more unknowns in this actual approximation. So if I want to, I can find, or I can plot it with my other functions. So in my plot command, I'm going to put a squiggle bracket around everything. 
because I am going to now add my approximation function. So as we can see, they're almost identical. See that? We had that blue line before. I added in my approximation. They're almost exactly the same. If you guys want for additional clarity, we can actually put a legend, plot legend. Oops, not plot K, plot legends. Our first one was exact solution. Our second one was our approximate solution. And if I were to run it again, as we can see, they're almost identical. Now, question for you guys. If I know the approximation function, could I use this function to find the approximate moment and the approximate shear? What do you think? What do you think? Could I use my approximation function now to find an approximation for both moment as well as shear? No? No one wants to answer? I know you guys know the answer. I'm not dumb. I know you guys are saying, well, of course, Clayton. I'm just too scared to type it in chat. Don't be scared to type things in chat. I do it all the time. Watch. Oops. I just about sent a direct message to Sean. I want, how do I send to everybody? Okay, everyone in meeting. Oh, thank you for answering. Yes, of course we can. So now that we have our approximate solution, I can find my approximate moment, m approx, because we know it's just going to be em times ig times the second derivative of our displacement, which we know is, oops, yeah, y approx. Second derivative, so x1 twice. And we know that for shear, copy and paste it down here, switch this to v, uh, this will be three times. I can find those functions and I can throw them into my graphs. So this would be here, here, we're adding m approx divided by a million. Did it work right? Yep, yeah. good to go. Same with v. v approx. Oh, divided by a thousand. So now things start to look a little bit different. So notice that for our approximation function for deflection, it's looking pretty good. For the moment, it starts getting a little bit more off. And then once we have shear, it's just constant. And that makes sense, because if we look at our approximation function, we stopped, uh, I'll, I'll put it out here actually really quick. We stopped at x cubed. So once I differentiate that three times, I'm just going to have constant. So there's no actual way of modeling the shear using our actual approximation. What could we do to fix that? If I wanted a better approximation of shear, what could I do to fix that? What do you guys think? Add more terms, exactly. The nice thing about code is once you have it, it's really simple to add more terms. I go to my approximate solution, say, okay, well, this was good, but I wanted a little bit better. Let's say I wanted a4 times x1 to the fourth plus a5 times x1 to the fifth. So I added two more terms. I come down here and say, okay, are my essential boundary conditions going to change? What do you guys think? Are my essential boundary conditions going to change? I'm relying on you, David. The class is too scared to speak, but I know you got this. Will this change? No, exactly. Central boundary conditions stay the same. Our approximate displacement function, will that change? Yes, because it's a function of those coefficients. So if I added a4 and a5, I have to add a4 star, and I have to add a5 star. So I made two modifications, added it here, added it here. Will this, my internal virtual work equation change? 
What do you guys think? Will my internal virtual work equation change? E doesn't change. Moments of inertia doesn't change. The second derivative, well, that doesn't change. The other second derivative, that doesn't change either. So this actually stays the same. If we look at our internal or uh, our external virtual work, that doesn't change either. It's based upon the loading. The loading doesn't change. We come down here. Ah, this will change because this is coefficient dependent. But all I would do is just copy it, put it down here, and sorry, <laughs> equation one, two, three, four, a two star, a three star. Well, this will be a five. And then this, of course, will be a 4 and a 5. Now, instead of solving two equations, we have to solve four equations. Equation 3 equal to 0. Equation 4 is equal to 0. We're solving for those last two terms, a 4 and a 5. I'm going to store those terms, a 5. Good to go. Notice how my shear or my moments much closer. Notice that my shear it's closer, even though it's still completely off. We would have to add a lot of terms to try and get this behavior using a polynomial. <laughs> a lot of terms, but look at the actual deflection. It's basically identical. Isn't that nice? So that's the method of virtual work. Again, if you were to look at your assignment, it doesn't really change that much. The only thing that you're going to have to change for your assignment is the loading and the boundary conditions. That's it, loading and boundary conditions. Let's look at the assignment really quick together. And let's just go through the boundary conditions together because a lot of students seem to struggle a lot with boundary conditions. Come down here, where's the assignment? Assignment 9, 61 attempts. Preview. Here's your beam. What are going to be my two boundary conditions? What do you think? What are my two boundary conditions for the left-hand side? If I'm looking at the left-hand side, what are my two boundary conditions? If you don't want to answer, that's fine. I, I, I don't mind just calling the lecture. <laughs> Displacement is zero, absolutely correct. Moment is zero, absolutely correct. Would it be the same on the other side? Yes, exactly. You have your four boundary conditions. That's all you would have to do. If we were to look here, we basically don't have a point load. So if I were to go to my code, class example, and I were to just put the point load as zero, and I were to switch these two boundary conditions, this one's rotation. Well, actually, this is a good question. Would I put the moment boundary condition in to here? Is moment an essential boundary condition? No, it's not. But we said that at the other end, there is no displacement. So y approx when x1 is equal to L, that must also be equal to zero. So that's what would change there. Solve for two. Uh, internal virtual work, that'd stay the same. External virtual work, basically we can just get rid of this one because there's only one, which is the, the actual point load. Yeah. And as we can see, we like this is still the, the cantilever beam, so don't listen to this one. But as we can see, we have our approximate solution. Once you have the code once, it's, it's a piece of cake. We can even modify this really quick if we wanted to, but I, I don't know, that'll take too much time. But yeah, that is, like look at the moment profile, <coughs> the shear, they're the exact same. Yeah, 
So that's it. What was it? Two modifications to your code to make it from this code to the assignment code. Now, the code that we did the example with today, I'll post it in eClass. So you can just download it directly and modify it as you wish. We did it together. You should have the benefits of doing it together. So that is, in or I guess, the virtual work method for Euler Bernoulli beams. Do you have any questions or did that help? Actually, that, that's the question I'm going to ask you. Did it help doing this together in Mathematica? Or do you think that you'd prefer to go back to just doing it in lectures? Helped a lot? Okay, wonderful. That's all I wanted from this. You guys should be good to go. If you have any questions for the assignment, let me know. Uh, I have some free time, finally, now. So I'm going to start responding to all those emails I got from you guys. So that's it for today's lecture. If you guys have the chance, again, please do the USRIs. I appreciate it a lot. Again, I'm still new to this, so any feedback you can give me, I, I would love it. I want to make sure that you all have the best education possible. That's what it's all about, having the best education possible. All right, so again, yeah, that's it for today's lecture. Uh, I'll upload this to YouTube right away, which is great. Uh, that's the nice thing about doing it at home, too. It's very easy to upload. All right, you all have a wonderful day. Oh, thanks, Ellen. I really appreciate it. You, you are all the nicest people I've ever met. The graduate students are not so nice. <laughs> so this is great to see. Uh, no problem. Again, I'll upload the code to eClass as well. <clears throat> Thank you so much, guys. Let's just check. What was I doing? Participants. Okay, yeah. Have fun in your classes today. And don't slip. It's really slippery out there today. So be careful. Oh, really? No, no buses today. Good thing it was online. Ah, I predicted this, obviously. <laughs> ah, no, that's crazy. Yeah, stay safe out there. It's, it's not too nice. <laughs>